IS Academy, it's the Hindu analysis. So in the first page we have taken up the article uh, GST bought down on 14 COVID relief goods. So the GST council has actually decided to waive the tax levy on two critical drugs against COVID-19 and mycosis. Mycosis, also known as black fungus, actually affects those people whose immunity is reduced. This uh, might be due to uh, the COVID-19 treatment they might have been uh, going on and uh, while using uh, drugs like steroids and uh, uh, antibiotics, the immunity response might have reduced and as a result, uh, black fungus might have, like, uh, they might be affected by black fungus. So, okay, uh, and apart from that, they have reset tax rate uh, to 5% for 14 major pandemic relief items till September 30. And apart from this, ambulances which are currently taxed at 28%, their tax has been reduced to uh, 12% and also temperature checking equipment and uh, uh, the electric furnace used for crematoriums will attract only 5% GST instead of 18%. So these are the um, changes that they have made. So we look at what GST Council is. GST Council is actually a constitutional body and it's, under article, it's mentioned under Article 279A of the Constitution and it recommends to the Union and State Government on tax issues related to goods and service tax. Now GST Council is considered as a federal body. Why is this? Because the members, if you look at the members of the council, you can see members from state and the union government together. It is chaired by the union finance minister and it has a minister of state of revenue or finance and it has all ministers from the state who are in charge of finance or taxation. So all uh, finance ministers or ministers who are in charge of the taxation or finances are members uh, of um, the GST council. And the GST council uh, in, how is the decision taken in GST Council? So a majority of not less than three-fourths of the weighted votes of the members present and voting is required to come uh, to a decision. So here it is mentioned weighted votes. All right. So it means the vote of the central government shall have a weightage of one-third of the total votes cast. So here the central government has uh, more value when it comes to voting and uh, the votes of all state governments taken together shall have a weightage of two-thirds of the total votes cast in that meeting. So you need to know that here when it comes to the value of voting, uh, the central government has more power. So the next article is uh, Operation Olivia to rescue um, Olive Ridley turtles. So it comes under GS3 environment. And here Operation Olivia you need to know is uh, taken up by the Indian Coast Guard. And it is for protecting the Olive Ridley turtles. So Olive Ridley turtles are turtles which you can find in tropical warm waters and they are um, you know their habitat is being reducing their population is reducing because of the threats they are facing so we we'll look into it so they are endangered species they are in vulnerable uh, list when it comes to IUCN list, red list and uh, they are mostly found in Odisha, Odisha coast in India and uh, this mission is happening in Odisha coast mostly uh, so the operation is conducted every year. Every year this operation happens uh, during the nesting season of uh, the, uh, you know, alive red turtles. The breeding, the breeding season uh, and to conserve their natural breeding habitats. Alright. So Operation Olivia, more details uh, about the um, operation. So round clock surveillance is going to be there. So the Coast Guard is going to uh, survey this area for any illegal poaching or, you know, fishing which is not friendly. Uh, to the uh, survival of these turtles and then they prevent fishing vessels entry into the major breeding sites so these sites are actually Gahirmada beach and Roshikulia beach uh, so in these areas um, you know a lot of uh, alive rotary turtles walks in uh, to lay the eggs so at that time they prevent fishing vessels and all and then vigil on the illegal fish fishing and turtle catching in this area is also increased and also they interact, the Coast Guard uh, members interact with fishermen and people of the local community to spread awareness about the importance of conserving these species. Now let's see what Olive Ridley turtles are. So Olive Ridley turtles are the smallest and most abundant of all sea turtles found in the world. And they are best known for the unique mass nesting called Aribada. Aribada is a Spanish word which means arrival. So, in this, uh, their mass nesting, uh, as I said, thousands of uh, alive red turtles just moves into the beach uh, to lay eggs during the uh, breeding season. So, these uh, this species alive red turtles are found in warm and tropical waters. You can find them in both uh, Pacific and Indian Ocean, and also in warm waters of uh, Atlantic Ocean. 
and what are the threats they are facing? They are facing unfriendly turtle fishing practices. For example, fishing nets will be you know left off in sea, and it might actually kill these animals. It might trap these animals and affect their survival. And also development projects like you know setting up of ports or tourist uh, infrastructure, anything uh, might be against the uh, interest of uh, survival of these species. And uh, they are protected under IUCN in red list. They are given uh, the vulnerable tag. So if you look at here, it's uh, you know it comes under the endangered part. Like it, it, they are a matter of concern. And uh, in sites, they are mentioned in Appendix One and Wildlife Protection Act under the Indian government. They are listed in Schedule One. So they are protected under these acts. Okay. So the next article is about no trade off between lives and livelihoods in the long run. So it is about an interview. Uh, done with uh, Brango Milan Novik, who is a uh, you know lead economist in the World Bank's uh, research department, who used to be a lead economist in the World Bank's uh, research department, and he actually um, talks about the different method that uh, you know China US has adopted, and also how what kind of problem India is facing dealing with the COVID-19 situation. All right. So yes. So what he says is that. India, the United States of America and China has actually uh, played well in their positive points when it comes to dealing with COVID-19, but at their weak points, they have not played really well. So, what is the uh, good point when it comes, bad point and good point when it comes to China and USA in dealing with COVID-19? So, the bad thing is that political system in China is such that the uh, you know low lo uh, level lower level government. That is the lower level of administrative units in China. When the beginning of the during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, tried to you know hide the uh, situation, tried to push it under the cap carpet and not you know take proper you know let the higher levels of administration know that we have this problem. So during the, due to that kind of political system, they were you know they failed to actually control this pandemic in the initial state. But later, the good part is that. Although we say China is a communist country, uh, like we know that practically it's autocratic, so they have the ability to, you know, implement any kind of stringent action, any kind of protocols. So because of that, they were able to discipline the population. They were able to put forward, you know, make every protocols, uh, you know, a reality, and everyone was following it. And as a result, they were able to deal with the pandemic. And when it comes to USA. As USA is a democracy and they have an inability to impose any measures directly, uh, you know, autocratically like um, you know China does, they were having problems. And as a result, they had the highest cases, um, you know, the highest number of death and um, COVID positive cases. So the good part is that due to the technological advancement, they were able to develop vaccines in such a short time, and also at the same time, they were able to, you know, uh, the rollout of the vaccine in the US also was quite successful. And when it comes to India's case, actually India was considered, so he says that India was considered as a success in the initial state because in India already we, although we um, you know, expected a huge, a worse case, we were having a better result, like the cases were not that high, but during the second wave we faced you know, very, um, a very bad situation. So uh, why did this happen? He says that the disregard by the government is one reason because uh, they were um, not thinking about the they were not prepared about the danger of the virus coming back and also disregard by the people. So people thought that the virus were behind them and they were not following uh, the proper COVID protocols and also this might be the reason he is saying. And also mRNA vaccines largely deployed in the US and parts of Europe and UK. Uh, this um, advantage India does not have and he says that vaccine nationalism is the reason behind it because uh, vaccine nationalism means that uh, you know, those countries who make these vaccines won't be ready to uh, you know give those vaccines out until their uh, entire population is vaccinated so they won't be willing to trade off uh, the extra vaccines they have but we also know that mrna vaccines require very you know call stories like uh, negative 70 degrees celsius and all so it is uh, like not really possible for a country like India to, you know, uh, with uh, very less storage and bad logistics to, you know, take care of mRNA vaccines. So these countries have decided that they are not going to export vaccines, and also, also another thing is that poor population in India is huge, and uh, when we are talking about lockdowns. 
we are not sure whether it will save lives because of the huge population of huge population of poor people in india it might backfire so that is another reason that we talks about so that's all about that article so the next article we have taken up is about uh, monoclonal antibody treatment beneficial so it is uh, now uh, the doctors and uh, researchers says that monoclonal antibody treatment is seen as a relatively effective and safer alternative in treating covid-19 patients and uh, uh, this uh, treatment was uh, previously used to treat diseases like ebola and hiv and it, the, the doctor says that it can be given up to uh, 10 days uh, given up to 10 days from the beginning of the symptoms and is not for low oxygen level patients so they have mentioned that it is not ideal for giving it to low oxygen level patients not for everybody but uh, you know people with uh, mild cases of covid can make use of this uh, treatment so what is basically a uh, monoclo uh, monoclonal antibody treatment so they are artificially created antibodies that aim to aid the body's natural immune system so these antibodies are not created by body itself they are artificially created by cloning and they target a specific antigen <coughs> so how are they created so monoclonal antibodies can be created in the lab by exposing white blood cells to a particular antigen so when we say antigen it can be a foreign body like a pathogen like a virus a bacteria or any toxic substance so by exposing white blood cell to a particular antigen we will uh, create an antibody in, in the body of the patient and to increase the uh, quality of the antibodies produced a single white blood cell is cloned which in turn is used to create identical copies of the antibodies and in the case of covid-19 science usually work with the spike proteins of the sars-cov-2 virus which facilitates the entry of the virus in the host cell so what is antibody antibody is also called immunoglobulin is a protective protein produced by the immune system in response to the presence of a foreign substance called an antigen so when antigen is present in the body any kind of a foreign body any kind of virus or bacteria is produced uh, like a presence is detected in the body the body creates antibodies that is in order to fight these antigen and make them exit the body so that is uh, antibody and they recognize and attack the antigen in order to remove from the body okay so that's it uh, the next article is about bitcoin so why this is in the news because el salvador became the first sovereign nation to make cryptocurrency a legal tender so it is a uh, first we know what cryptocurrency is what uh, bitcoin is uh, so el salvador has done it for the first time and el salvador has previously dollarized its economy in 2001 which means they are in this country they are using um, the dollar as their country as their currency so why do they do it um, one reason is that uh, you know this will actually uh, increase investment in this area and also in this country and also it might be because their uh, you know official currency might have became a failure <coughs> now Another reason is that countries' economy is also heavily uh, reliant on remittances. This is uh, why they have taken up cryptocurrency. Because when uh, uh, like the country, uh, this country is depending up on uh, the uh, land of remittances. So remittances means, uh, for example, like uh, a lot of citizens of El Salvador will be living outside this country. So they are sending, um, they are working outside, and they are sending. money back to their home hometown their country so that is known as remittances and this uh, is a huge part of the gdp of el salvador so in that case uh, when they are used they want to use cryptocurrency they will be able to save on transaction fee of banks and agencies this is another point um, said in this article and also it is also expected to boost financial inclusion in their country this because uh, the citizens of this country will not be having proper access to formal banking uh, channels so when uh, this is entirely made digital and they are going to use cryptocurrencies this will be um, you know much more easier they will be able to include more people you know they, uh, their banking system will be more inclusive so el salvador is actually a country that's uh, in present in the central america all right it's between the north america and south america so it's better if you could um, go to the map and check out where what's the location of this country because in geography questions will be asked like uh, you know which are the neighboring countries uh, around el salvador 
so such kind of questions are expected in UPSC uh, prelims exam so it's better you check out uh, where is the location of this country so we will see what uh, Bitcoin is what cryptocurrency is okay Bitcoin is just one kind of cryptocurrency so we will see what cryptocurrency is cryptocurrency is a specific type of virtual currency which is decentralized and protected by cryptographic encryption technology when we say decentralized it means there is no central authority that is actually regulating this currency okay and it is uh, like uh, you know made by a technology called it is supported by a technology called blockchain and it is created by mining a process called mining and other like uh, cryptocurrencies are like ethereum ripple um, bitcoin these are the kind of cryptocurrencies we have many actually and <clears throat> okay Okay, when uh, and it comes to uh, when it comes to blockchain technology, what happens is that every transaction, when every transaction is made, the user keeps a tap on every digital coin and transaction rather than a banking system with a governing body at its center. So it is uh, with blockchain technology, we'll be tracking the movement of the digital coin. And uh, why why is that the a lot of governments have not really accepted uh, the cryptocurrency? This is because. Uh, they do not have centralized control so government won't be able to you know control the regulate the this currency so actually governments around the uh, con uh, around the world are actually wary of cryptocurrencies because of this reason and they and as a result it will be extreme uh, volatile extremely so this might affect the economy of the country and also high energy cost is required because the blockchain technology that is used to support uh, this uh, technology, uh, I mean this cryptocurrency actually consumes a lot of uh, power. It requires a powerful systems in order to uh, support it. And most countries have warned the citizens against investing in cryptocurrencies that are not allowing transaction in them because uh, you know as they have said uh, it's very volatile, you, anything might happen, the value might go up quickly and it might come down anytime. So it will affect uh, the finances uh, of people and also it might affect the economy of the country. So some have tried to use the technology to create government sanctioned digital currencies, yes. So as I said, although some countries have, you know, most of the countries have deferred from using, um, you know, told the citizens to stay away from cryptocurrencies, countries like China have actually come up with their own cryptocurrency. For example, they have come with digital yuan. And also, um, England, the country England have come up with digital sterling. Okay. But many countries including India have allowed the treatment of cryptocurrencies as commodities. That means you can invest in this uh, cryptocurrency but you might not be able to use it for transaction uh, in other cases. So another problem is, uh, okay, this I have already mentioned that uh, increasing energy use is there uh, for cryptocurrencies. Uh, so it's high energy consumption and it's also very volatile when it comes to, you know, the economy. Because for example, recently if you just see, uh, you know, just because of tweets of uh, Elon Musk, the value of cryptocurrency had gone up like anything. But recently, um, many cryptocurrencies have lost their value too. So next article we have re revised subsidies to spur EV demand. So in this article what we have is that electric two-wheeler makers term increased support under Sanders Fame 2 scheme as game changer. So under Fame 2 scheme of the government, the they have the government have decided to give 50% incentive when it comes to uh, electric vehicle, that is two-wheeler electric vehicle. So uh, many electric two-wheeler makers have said that this is a phenomenal change. So we'll see what uh, Fame India is. Actually, Fame India is uh, faster adoption on manufacturing of electronic vehicles, and it is aimed at incentivizing all vehicle segments. That is, um, you know, all electronic vehicles like two wheelers or three wheelers or four wheelers, and even light commercial vehicles and buses to incentivize them so that we adopt more electric vehicles, and hence we reduce, we cut down the import of. Uh, uh, the crude oil, uh, the petrol and diesel and also we can um, you know have a better environment conservation. So it comes under the wanting authority of uh, FAME project is the Department of Heavy Industries and uh, they have four focus areas. They are like their objective is to develop technology for you know for example uh, lithium-ion battery technology, better technology to uh, you know 
consume energy in a better effective manner than demand creation to create demand for electronic vehicles so so that more people buy these vehicles then pilot projects different projects to develop uh, the technology and uh, you know uh, the vehicles and then charging infrastructure charging infrastructure is very much required because if uh, we buy electronic vehicles we require them to be charged um, you know just like the petrol pumps we have we need more charging centers so th these are the focus areas of uh, this uh, project <clears throat> and what are other salient features of phase 2 scheme they aim to boost electronic mobility and increase the number of electric vehicles in commercial fleets and uh, the target recently they have set a target of uh, 1000 10000 crores um, they have made for until 2022 they have uh, released uh, an outlay of rupees 10000 crore and government will offer the incentives for electric buses three wheelers and four wheelers to be used for commercial purposes so these are addition to the fame scheme the fame 2 scheme has added these points uh, like added these incentives uh, into the new revised scheme and then plug in hybrid vehicles and those with a sizable lithium ion battery and electric motor will also be included in the scheme and physical support offered depending on size of the battery so uh, we know that hybrid vehicles are also included here plug in hybrid vehicles so there are different kind of vehicles right there are full uh, fully automated full uh, electric vehicles and then there are hybrid vehicles which are also going to use petrol and uh, then um, the battery too so that has also been added in the paint to scheme so that's all about it for more such videos to subscribe to our youtube channel you can also follow us on social media we are, we are on, acting on instagram facebook where we are posting all the important updates you can also join our telegram channel where we post all the updates UPC related updates so that's all thanks for watching the video